call to order this regular meeting of the Beverly City Council and it's also a joint meeting with the Planning Board Monday June 7th 2021 Miss Kent could you please call the roll Ames here Copeland Feldman here Flaherty Flowers here Houseman here Rand here Rotundo here and Blunty here Councilor Feldman could you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kathleen. And I just want to thank Councilor Houseman for doing a wonderful job leading us in the pledge the past 15 months from the comfort of his own home. Uh, okay, first on the agenda, I am going to read, uh, we're going to go to resolutions. It's order number 124, and I sent the council a letter that said, attached, please find for your consideration a resolution that was sent to me by the Teamsters Union with their concerns that they have with Amazon. And tonight we have to address this is Beverly resident, Mr. Peter Berry. Uh, Peter, if you want to go to the microphone and let us know how this came before. I know that you contacted me, but... Give us a little history, please. Good evening. First, I'd like to thank Mayor Cahill and uh, Council President Guanci and the entire council for uh, allowing me to speak tonight in support of this uh, Amazon resolution. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a lifelong Beverly resident. Uh, other than the years I spent in the Marine Corps, I've been here my whole life. I'm also a executive board member of Teamsters Local 25 in uh, the city of Boston. But we represent uh, members from the entire state. And uh, the way this resolution came about was, um, you know, we just felt that this company has been uh, able to operate on an unlevel playing field, so to speak, um, in comparison to the other companies that do the exact type same type of work that they do, like UPS and DHL. Um, this resolution has been adopted, this non-binding resolution has been adopted in similar uh, fashion unanimously in uh, the cities of Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Medford, Malden, Revere, Chelsea, Lynn, Winthrop, Lawrence, and Peabody. Uh, so the reasoning uh, we put this together, because of the pandemic, um, as all of you know, we've all become pretty reliant on the e-commerce uh, industry. But not all these companies are, you know, treating their employees the same way. Um, so the subject matter is Amazon, one of the wealthiest companies in the world. And uh, they just continue to grow and increase their distribution network um, and increase profits, but at, at the cost of their workers. They fail to meet obli basic obligations to their neighbors as well as their employees. So just a little bit about their safety record. 2019, Amazon recorded over 14,000 serious injuries across its fulfillment centers in the country, uh, requiring days off and you know job restrictions and all that. These in uh, injury rates have gone up substantially over the past four years due to the company's, uh, as a record, the company's own record. Across the country, Amazon employees have staged protests calling on the company to raise its minimum wage from $15 to a more livable wage, considering the company's profits and the wealth of the CEO, Jeff Bezos. Amazon has a history of treating its workers poorly. During the pandemic, Amazon workers have complained of not being provided with ad adequate PPE to do their job safely. They also reported over 20,000 positive COVID cases within their facilities. So what happens if they come set up shop here in Beverly? This is a working class city with strong work ethics and values, where small businesses have suffered due to COVID-19. I know several on the council are small business owners, so I'm sure you get the point where if another business came to set up shop next to you, they'd have an unfair advantage if they don't have to adhere by the same rules and regulations that you do, which is where this resolution comes into place. 
So what we're asking for is just them to meet basic community standards, like I referred to earlier, similar co companies that do this type of work that we represent, UPS and DHL. But they work on a different playing field, like I said. They use independent contractors. They're not considered actual employees of the company, so they don't have to pay them any benefits or cover them by workman's compensation or, or any of the like. Whereas companies like UPS, DHL, they do. They treat the, you know, they're, they're actual employees of the company. They have to fall under safe driving rules and work under better conditions. You know, they have to beat background checks, you know, go in front of, you know, screening boards. They have to take, you know, drug analysis tests. So there's a lot more scrupulation with the employees that work for these companies as compared to Amazon that don't require any of that because they're not employees of the company, even though they're putting their Amazon packages on your doorstep every single day. So in closing, I thank you for the opportunity to speak on this, um, and I just hope you would consider uh, adopting this resolution on behalf of all those workers in the community that, that we live in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Any councilors have any questions uh, for Mr. Berry? Okay, I'll quickly, Peter, I'll read the resolution. I'll, Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilor Ames, my bad. New with so, this. So, um, <laughs> thank you for coming before us and bringing this issue to light. I think it's important. I think wherever we can, we want to have people earn a living wage and have benefits here in Beverly to be able to live here and thrive here. And um, so do you think that um, this pressure that you're bringing to bear across the eastern part of the state is going to make an impact with Amazon regionally? Well, that's our hopes. I mean, we only ask that they try to treat their workers that are, you know, some of them are residents of here in Beverly and these surrounding communities. They work in and out of our cities. They drive their trucks in and out of our city all the time. But by them not following basic guidelines and adhering to, you know, Department of Transportation rules because they're, they're not actual employees, you know, it puts our communities at risk. So I, we feel it's just the right thing to do for these cities and towns to say, put them on notice and say, listen, all we're asking is for you to do business the way these other companies that are doing the same exact type of work do business. Well, thank you for bringing us before us. And, you know, we go back a long way. You're a solid Be Beverly citizen, married to a solid Beverly citizen, with well, two sons that. who are solid Beverly citizens. So I think it's always good for us to hear these issues and see how we can support the people who work here in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, Council Ames. Anybody else? Okay, so I'll read the resolution, then I'll ask for a motion to approve. Uh, resolution for fair and full employment opportunities Amazon, at Amazon. Whereas Amazon has targeted the city of Beverly for expansion of its e-commerce network. And whereas COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on the health, safety, and well-being of the residents of the city of Beverly. And whereas state and local guidelines to prevent the spread and curtail transmission of the coronavirus have had a devastating economic impact on local retail establishments in the city of Beverly and have changed the retail options for the residents of the city of Beverly. And whereas preventative measures put in place to combat COVID-19 and whereas existing retail and e-commerce delivery networks currently operate in the city of Beverly and set community standards for family sustaining wages, benefits, including but not limited to e uh, quality health insurance and secure retirement. And whereas these de retail and e-commerce delivery options coexist in Beverly, Beverly's diverse neighborhoods while adding value to the fabric of the community, including offering good careers for Beverly residents to provide for their families. And whereas existing e-commerce delivery options have aptly served the residents of the city of Beverly throughout the COVID-19 pandemic while maintaining the highest of standards for its essential workforce. Now, therefore, be it resolved, who's that? The Beverly City Council, of course, the Beverly City Council <laughs> hereby assembled 
encourages Amazon to sit down with the Beverly community, included but not limited to representatives from the International Brotherhood of Teams, which is local number 25, locally impacted neighborhood groups, local residents, and other interested parties to discuss how Amazon can expand delivery oper operations, warehouses, and fulfillment centers in a way that is beneficial to the city of Beverly and its residents, guaranteeing, guarantee, guaranteeing, it's been a long time, sustainable growth for the city and helping to ensure that fair and equitable employment standards are maintained for all e-commerce delivery networks throughout the city of Beverly. And it be further resolved that prior to any expansion into the city of Beverly that Amazon's operation meets or exceeds current community standards set by existing e-commerce delivery networks. This would include all delivery drivers to be direct employees of Amazon and not independent contractors. Amazon will ensure that all employed delivery drivers pass the most rigorous background checks, including Cori checks, and are compliant with all federal DOT drug testing guidelines. Amazon will only hire competent and safe delivery drivers that will maintain the utmost professional conduct in their day-to-day -day operation in the neighborhoods of the city of Beverly. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Thank I you. would entertain a motion to approve the resolution. So moved. moved. Second. And a roll call, Ms. Kent. No oh, no, call. no roll no. call. No. Okay. All set. <sighs> All those in favor, aye. 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 All those opposed, the resolution passes seven to zero. And before Mr. Barry steps down, I have a little bit of trivia. Uh, Mr. Barry's brother-in-law was the greatest city council president of all time, Mr. Bruce Nardella, <laughs> back in the mid-90s. Don't tell anybody, buddy. I had to pay to say that, right? Oh, well, you know what? <laughs> Always trying to get on his good side. <laughs> no, he was very instrumental, along with Mayor Scanlon, of really turning the city's finances around back then. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your support. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Best of the family. Seven fifteen. We're going to do it right now. No, we're doing the public hearing first. Okay, let's move down to our seven fifteen public <laughs> hearing on order number one fifteen. Miss Kent, could you please uh, read that order? Hello. Order number 115, the City of Beverly ordered that the City Council of the City of Beverly hold a public hearing on Monday, June 7th, 2021 at 7.15 p.m. at 191 Cabot Street, third floor, Council Chambers, Beverly, Mass. Relative to the interdepartmental transfer of $537,500 for various FY 2021 costs. And this was in the paper on May 21st. Thank you, Ms. Kent. And our Finance Director, Mr. Brian Ailes, is here to talk about this. Mr. Rails. Thank you, Mr. President. Councillors, it's good to be here uh, in person in front of you this evening for a change. Um, you have before you this evening a request to transfer funds uh, between departments, uh, which requires approval of the City Council. Uh, so this is not an increase to any appropriation. It's merely a shifting of already appropriated funds. Um, the areas that we are seeking to transfer the monies from um, are the reserve for unforeseen, uh, a transfer of $514,409. You uh, will recall in late fall uh, of 2020, there was a supplemental appropriation that the council approved. Uh, part of that appropriation placed uh, roughly $480,000 into the reserve for unforeseen in addition to what remained within that category. The thinking at that time was that it was a contingency against any COVID-related uh, CARES um, disallowances, if you will. Um, we also were concerned that the CARES funding stream at that point was going to dry up uh, at the end of December of 2020. It had since, been, since that time been extended uh, to the end of this calendar year, which allowed us to continue to utilize those funds and not need this reserve uh, or contingency that we set aside collectively. Um, in addition, we also thought uh, if the winter was uh, a worse winter than usual, we would uh, possibly need to tap these funds uh, to uh, facilitate snow removal, plowing, road treatment, et cetera. Um, we were fortunate in that the, uh, from that point forward, um, the, the winter wasn't as severe as, as possible. Um, and therefore, the funds are available to be transferred. Um, in addition to that, we are also requesting a transfer out from our workers' comp uh, medical bill line. 
uh, of $23,091. Uh, these funds will then be moved into uh, three areas, the animal control overtime line uh, for $2,500 additional dollars uh, to be spent before June 30th, uh, the litigation line within the solicitor's department for an additional $35,000, uh, and uh, a half a million dollars into the road and sidewalk capital fund, which will help facilitate some additional roads uh, being paved uh, with it within that fund. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Thank you, Mr. Rills. Any questions from members of the city council? Councilor Rand. Thank you. Can you remind me um, just the 500,000 that's being transferred into roads and sidewalks? Will you remind me what the proposal is for that funding? Like, as in which roads and sidewalks, or is that not determined? Yeah, so it doesn't, it, the way it, it works is there's a capital fund, which is basically a bucket of funds that uh, engineering then uses to go out and, and do a number of projects throughout the city. Um, what we do know is slated for kind of the next couple of roads um, to, to be addressed are, um, I believe it is, uh, Mayor, do you? You do. Uh, Hancock, Jackson. Oh, come on, you probably know the others. Thanks, Mr. Eels. Mr. President, okay. Councillor, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, you, you can see Hancock and Jackson have some water work going on right now in anticipation of paving them this year. We had been looking to pave Colon this year from Brimble to Heather, but when we approached National Grid, because we always give them the heads up, they said, oh, we need to do gas main work there. So we're looking to repurpose. Um, and you know, as you folks know, we had some conversations with you earlier this year to solicit you know, some of your thoughts on what's needed. Um, and we, we periodically are meeting with Commissioner Collins, uh, Mr. Barber, the city engineer, Mr. Ailes. Um, and we have another meeting scheduled of that group early next week. So you know, figuring that you folks are gonna wanna remind us of some, some areas in the meantime, so please do. I mean, that's, that's the process, as you know. Um, so I, I hope that answers. Thank you. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor Cahill. Anybody else? Uh, let's go this side and then we'll go, I'm going to alternate. So let's go to Councilor Houseman, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. and Thank you, Mr. Ailes. Uh, so just so I understand, uh, the administration is planning on allocating some of this to complete the work on Jackson and Hancock. Is that correct? It's correct. Uh, very happy to hear that. I know myself and uh, some of my other fellow councilors have have been sort of ringing the bell on on uh, those streets because they've been mostly half done for for many many years, and I know the residents will appreciate that. Um, uh, just to confirm, the rest of Odell will be completed this year as well. It's already underway. The work has started. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ames. Um, a big woo-hoo for Jackson and Hancock, even from outside the ward. Um, they, they certainly deserve the love. Um, so I just, so you're not exactly sure from where you're going to go from that point. And um, I'm sure we as counselors would love more insight moving forward on that. I was just curious if there was, if roads and sidewalks were the only use for this capital fund. Yes. That's my first question. Uh, I got one other. Well, intersection redesign, sometimes there's okay. some design work related to some larger projects um, that we might utilize these funds for as well. Okay. Oh, gosh. I lose it. I think the second one has disappeared into the ether. I'm nervous <laughs> here, too. So I think. Want to come back? Well, yeah, you can come back. Let's go all the yeah. way down to Council Feldman. All right, thank you. Um, you had mentioned, <coughs> was it 23000 that was coming out of the, being transferred out of the workers' comp? Line? Yes. And is that because it was not going to be used in this fiscal year? So, and that, that's bringing that budget that down to zero then? For that, now? That's or? correct. In fact, we've had the lowest um, expenditure level uh, in 10 years uh, through that line this fiscal year. We typically budget $300,000 into that line item. Okay. Um, and we've spent as high as 400 and some change uh, in 2016. And this year is the lowest. We've only spent 110,000 of it. 
Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Flowers. Thank you. Actually, Councilor Feldman just asked the question that I was going to ask. So I'll, I'll just only say that I'm very excited about Jackson and Hancock Street, as the mayor probably anticipated I would be. So thank you for that. And I'm sure former Mayor Thomas Crean is very excited about having his uh, street paved this year. Councilor Ames, you ready to go? So Yes. So my last question, which it's probably fairly obvious, but these dollars have not yet been spent. No, they have not. Okay. And you'll ex and how long do you think before they will be expended? So the way the fund works is it's a rolling fund. So there are still balances available from the Chapter 90 allotment this year okay. that we scheduled during the construction season, which we're basically in right now. Um, the goal with all of this, when we talk about roads and sidewalks, is we want to put as much resources <clears throat> into this category as we can. We know there's a need out there. Um, so the hope is with this additional 500,000, that'll bring the annual city allotment to 1.9 for this fiscal year. Okay. In addition to the million we received from chapter 90 this year. Yep. Come July 1, the, the request that's before you right now is another 2 million in city funds through the, the annual budget process and an additional 1 million from the state through chapter 90. So the goal is really to, to provide enough resources to really start making some headway on some, on some real needs among our neighborhoods. Okay, thank you. Mayor Cahill has, has gotten up. Just a, a little more context too. Uh, I think most of you know, we, we, get, we contract with a couple of different sidewalk contractors and a couple of paving. And there's a dance with them because they do work in multiple communities. And so we, we try to tee up work and get them into town and keep them here. Work, and, and so there's, there's a lot of, of work that engineering and, and uh, Commissioner Collins have to do to try to make sure that that's effective. Well, once we get them in town, we want to just keep kind of pushing the work at them. Um, so, and, and you know, we all know that there are many more streets to do than can be done in any given year. So, you know, that, that's why we're going to be sitting again. We sat earlier to make sure that the kickoff to spring, there, there was enough, you know, work teed up and agreed on that they could move forward. And now it's kind of checking back at it. Um, and, you know, and again, there's, it's part of the readiness of certain streets has to do with, um, you know, whether, whether grid has done their work, whether we've got some water uh, and or sewer work that needs doing under the street too. So that, that's what factors into what we all look at as the, the, con the various conditions or comparative <coughs> conditions of a given paving surface as well. Thanks. Councilor Rotundo. Mayor, before you leave the podium, <clears throat> try to grab you before that. Um, I know you ask us to put in requests for sidewalks and streets, what have you. Um, what is the method that you guys use with the commission? I know you guys meet as a group. I know there's certain things, there's programs out there, but yeah. ultimately, what is the real method that you use when the pot of money comes into the um, engineer department? Yeah, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's to continually upgrade our, our road rating index. I always get the pa pavement surface index, PSA. Uh, pavement surface index, uh, index, which we try to do every two years, and, and we, we just kind of look, we looked at some of that money now and said it's time to do it again. So we're going to be getting updated information there. Um, and it's also, you know, sometimes a street that may be in better condition than another jumps the list because the infrastructure under, under the street is in such tough condition, you know. Um, so those, and, you know, and, and trying to focus on, um, trying to focus on meeting the need around the city and balancing some, um, some neighborhood work with Main Street's work, right? I mean, there, there are so many uh, more heavily traveled roads that maybe don't hold up as, as well just because of the travel they get year in and year out. So it's trying to, trying to do something to balance the Main Streets and the side streets as well. It's, it's, not, it's not entirely, well, I mean, we try for it to be scientific in that we're, we're going off of these comparative grades that the roads get based on their, you know, the, the, the formulas looking at their integrity of the surface. Um, but then it's also taking into account some of that other, some of those other considerations about other infrastructure other, under the road um, and, and readiness to do work based on both that and, and the utilities. You know, as you, as you all know, we don't want utilities to come in and cut up a road right after we finished it. Commissioner Collins and the engineering team do an incredible job of an ongoing conversation with National Grid as the main utility under the street other than our own to try to manage that. Is that helpful? Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 
Uh, anybody else? Do any members of the public wish to make a comment on this public hearing? If not, then I will, uh, I will ask if anybody watching uh, via Google Meet has a question to type in in the chat. Their name. Your name and address and your question, and we can have, get an answer for you. Okay, let's go to uh, City Council Budget Analyst Jerry Perry. Mr. Perry? Mr. President and members of the Council, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here, finally. <laughs> So very happy to see everybody as, as opposed to looking at you on a computer. I'll be happy, man, when we take these masks off. I kind of hope we can encourage you in that area. Having said that, I do want to comment briefly about uh, the, the budget request. Um, just, uh, I sent you a memo at the end of last week about this, pretty straightforward stuff. The uh, reserve fund for seeing the $514,000 will completely deplete that fund. Uh, strategically, we were aware, I, know, I certainly I was, I know we talked about it uh, during the course of the year, consistent with the finance director's position, this was intended for this if we got through the COVID matters, which we did. So there's certainly no surprise in the utilization of that funds. With regard to the workers' comp, uh, the finance director is correct. Uh, there's quite a bit of funds left there. There is actually, based on my review, approximately $190,000 left in the account as we speak. So there's certainly sufficient funds, and you're going to see some turnbacks on that at the end of the year. But I believe, anyways, it's been a good year for workers' comp. Uh, will help us with the undesignated fund balance and the free cash. So expect that to happen. Uh, just two co a couple, few more comments on litigation. Um, you may not uh, recall, there was a bit of a cut uh, for the current fiscal year when we did the budget last year with Ms. Williams. Uh, account was about 8 or 9%, as I recall. Um, I am a little concerned, even with this year's budget, there may not be enough, uh, and, and we have to be prepared for that. A couple of reasons, there's quite a bit of litigation Coming forward, I think some of you were aware of a lot of it, but there's also the collective bargaining agreements are all up this year, so there's going to be quite a bit of work in that area. So uh, I just want to forewarn you in the event we should spend a little bit more than was uh, budgeted this year, we have to be prepared to maybe transfer at the end of next year. So just, just to bring that to your attention. With regards to the roads and sidewalk, um, uh, I've been asked a few things this year. Uh, at the behest of Councillor Ames, so you probably got an email from me today. I apologize, there's a lot of stuff there. As the Council President reminded me with uh, exclamation points of 67 spreadsheets. Um, my apologies to that, but there's quite a bit of information. There's historical data there uh, for you to go back and look at it at your leisure. As you know, Commissioner Collins will be here tomorrow night, so at least you have some information as to what's been going on in the past. And I know the Mayor is working hard with uh, Mr. Co uh, Commissioner Collins to try to get back on the track of showing you what they're looking for in the future, and they've already articulated some of the roads that they're going to be doing that as well. So that, that's uh, pretty much what we're doing. I know it's from a policy perspective, it's important to all of you with regard to that. Uh, it's something we certainly work on. One other thing I just want to add, <clears throat> and again, uh, because of Councillor Ames' comments, how this works mechanically is we appropriate money into an account that's under the executive branch. And then those funds are transferred into, a, as, as Brian said, a capital project fund. Capital project fund, as he indicates, it's a rolling fund. If we were to keep it into the executive branch, it would close out on June 30th, be reverted back to free cash. We couldn't spend it. So they rightfully, and I completely agree with what they do, they put it in this project so we can roll it. I mean, it's timing, procurement issues, a whole bunch of factors that require to carry over on a fiscal year. So it's a smart decision from the administration to be doing that, and that's the mechanics on an annualized basis of how we handle the funds associated with that. So bottom line, uh, you know, I'm comfortable with this. Certainly it's your prerogative whether you want to make these transfers, but as your budget analyst, I would recommend uh, uh, adoption of the administration's request. Mr. President, I'm more than happy to answer any questions anybody Thank may you. have. Mr. Perry, any questions for Mr. Perry, Councilor Houseman? Uh, yes, good evening, Mr. Perry. Uh, good to see you in person. Um, although I think the mask is probably an improvement. But, um, I am wearing a tie tonight. I was referring to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, uh, I, I want to ask you a little bit about this, this rolling fund. This is a fund that the administration, uh, as you described it, is, is this something that I gather other municipalities must do as well and that the city of Beverly has been doing for a long time also? Absolutely, yeah. Capital project funds are 
normal accounting methodologies used in all cities and towns in the Commonwealth and even throughout the country. It's for these purposes to make sure they go for the capital projects. To refresh your memory, we strategically use the capital project fund and how we uh, 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 put funding aside for the new police station. Yeah. We went over two separate years on free cash and we dumped it into a capital project fund as well as uh, actually three years. We did one year one and then two and two and we were able to take the money, dump it in there because if we didn't do that, we would lose it on June 30th to free cash and the money stays like in a savings account, if you will, and could be used when they're ready to expend the funds. So very common practice, yeah, it's very, we do it quite a bit here and it's done quite a bit elsewhere. Okay. Thank you for refreshing my memory. Appreciate sure. it. Thank you, Councillor Houseman. Mm -hmm. Councillor Ames. First, thank you, Mr. Perry, for all the information you gathered for me and to the administration for bringing it forward. It really was, it's insightful to see how these street and sidewalk budgets are built and where the money actually goes. It's incredibly helpful. The um, only, the last question I have is like, do you know what the balance currently is in this capital? Do you know? In this line? I, I do not know the answer to that. I don't know. Off, we can get that for you, but I don't offhand. Yeah. I don't know. Just, just. Yeah, we. I, I can give you a back of the envelope right now, but we yeah, can see the exact perfect. figure. I do know if the two million is approved in next year's budget, this this transfer is approved, and the um, chapter ninety comes in at the million for next year. That there will be roughly three point three, I believe, somewhere around there. So, in other words, it, it rolls pretty quickly. It doesn't we build. Chew, we definitely chew through it. I mean, these are expensive cool. projects. That's good. Um, Thank you. Asphalt's very expensive. Thank you, Councilor Ames. Anybody else? Okay, hearing no further questions or comments, I will close this public hearing and then entertain a motion to approve the transfer request. So moved. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries seven to zero. Yes. <laughs> okay, we have a joint public hearing scheduled at 8 o'clock tonight. I'd like to take care of two, uh, hopefully, quick things. Uh, can we uh, call something out of committee? Ms. Kent? Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby appoint subject to your review and recommendation, Mr. Richard Scanlon, 107 Salem Road, Bill Record, Bill Record to the Board of Assessors. Mr. Scanlon will fulfill the seat left vacant by Mr. Robert Marshall, who recently passed away. Mr. Scanlon is a highly regarded assessor and extremely knowledgeable in the field and would compliment the work being done by the board. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Mr. Scanlon, you're here, so come on up and introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thank you, members of the council, for allowing me to appear. Um, my name is Richard Scanlon. Um, I am the former uh, uh, chief assessor and chairman of the board of assessors in Billerica. I retired um, April 23rd at 60 years old, I'm happy to say. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Springfield. Um, I grew up in Wilmington. I went to Wilmington High School, graduated from there, did my undergrad work at Assumption College in Worcester. Um, I got into the business uh, working for the city of Woburn uh, a couple years out of college. I graduated in 1983. Uh, I worked my way through a junior appraiser, data collector, up to a senior appraiser. Um, I left in 1993 to take uh, the chief assessor's job in Bill Ricker and stayed almost 30 years, uh, 28 years actually. So um, let's see, personally, I live in Bill Ricker. I have two boys, um, ages 31 and 24, and two grand uh, grandchildren, ages uh, three and one. So um, I do have public service in the blood. Um, my dad was a longtime teacher and coach at uh, Wilmington High. They named the baseball field after him when he passed away years ago. Uh, my mom was a former town clerk in Wilmington for years. She's been retired about 15 years. And my brother Steve is the current high school uh, varsity soccer and hockey coach in Wilmington. So um, that's a little bit about myself. So. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon. Any questions? That's pretty good. I have one for you. Sure. Hockey player. Baseball player, professional from Bill Ricca. Give me two, one of each. I'll give you two. I'll give you many. I know, uh, but I got two in the back of my uh, head. One is certainly Tom Glavin. I went to his induction in the Hall of Fame in 2014. 
And uh, Gary Dusanciner, I actually, uh, his dad and my dad taught together in Wilmington High for years. Awesome. How about the hockey player? Hockey, uh, Tom got, got actually drafted by the Kings. Uh, right, he did. Mike Mastrullo played hockey and Bill Ricca, Paul Ames. But uh, the most famous is probably Bobby Miller. Oh, what about Tom Fitzgerald? That's 17 true. years of the end. There's so many Fitzgerald. Yeah, yeah, but they went to Austin Prep, so they don't. I know they did. They <laughs> <laughs> went with me. That's why I say that. There you go. There you go. Good stuff. <laughs> Burrick is a nice place to grow up. Great athletes. Yeah, sure. Definitely. Okay. Um, now what do I do now? That's your motion. I would entertain a motion. Really? It's been 15 months. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the appointment. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries eight to zero. Thank you very Thank much. You, I look Scanlon. forward to working here. Thank you. You come very highly recommended from Terry uh, DeBlaze, our yeah. assessor. Terry Peter and Terry, a great advice. Yeah, good crew. Thank you. Mr. President, if I could say I've worked with Rich for a number of years, he's top notch. Great. Good stuff. A lot of fans. Yep, I heard the same. Okay, we have one more thing. I am going to go to order number. 122, Superintendent Dr. Susan Tarochek, lease purchase transactions with Apple student laptops for the one-to-one -one laptop initiative at Beverly High School. Dr. Tarochek, Tarochek and Jean Sherbona here. Please. Hi, thank you very much for having us here. We're looking for uh, permission to enter into a four-year lease. Uh, for the laptop program. What you have attached to you is a quote for a 300, quantity of 300. We're still working out the specifics on how many we need, but what we need um, from you is permission to enter into a four-year lease. Right, and you've, con you've, well, you've done that in the past. <clears throat> Excuse me? I mean, we've done this in the past. Yes, you Ever have. Ever since we, yes. you... Um... Yes, we've, um, this is the 11th year that we're in the program. Two years we uh, went into a three-year lease because we missed the deadline of becoming coming before the city councils um, and we still have the same uh, program that's been working for the last um, 11 years that we do offer a um, scholarship program for the students uh, so the highest amount off could be 60 percent off down to 40 percent and then 20 percent and we do give um, do receive funding from the Beverly Ed Foundation to offset the 20 percent off um, and the funds for <clears throat> the offsets do have to come through the school appropriated budget and it's budgeted. And the um, cost for this would be um, hitting the FY22 budget. Thank you, Ms. Sherburn. Dr. Chirochik, anything to add? No. Not required, it's hot. <laughs> okay, any questions for Ms. Sherburn? Councilor Wren. Thank you. Um, first, I want to just take the chance to commend you for even having this program. I know in the past year that we saw other school districts that were not as prepared as Beverly is with one-to-one um, -one initiatives, and I, we all saw what a difference that made. So thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could share maybe just some kind of um, background numbers and details about the lease, like how many how many uh, computers does that lease cover? Is that, um, <coughs> does the lease cover just the cost of the, the programs and maintenance? And I'm sorry if it was in the actual lease, I didn't. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, what it is is um, the cost is, uh, is we have 300 um, computers. The, um, the cost of each computer is um, approximately 779. And why we say approximately is they do come out with a, um, a new model at this time, so, but it's too late for us to get city council approval, so it may reduce a little bit. There is a um, four-year Apple Care um, service on it for 229 <clears throat> So the whole total is 302400 for the 300 units. <clears throat> we have been able to uh, reduce the cost um, from the parents over the years, from 11 years ago when it started, um, and we're, think, we're targeting that it's going to be about um, 276, but I'm not spe specifically sure on that. And the reason why is that the Apple Care has upgraded it so it does cover insurance for um, if there's two losses in a year based on um, liquid physical damage, which is something that was not covered before. 
Um, the other thing that um, is really exciting this year is that Apple, um, if we do go into the four-year leases, is not going to be charging us any interest. So in the past, we've had to pass that on to the families that are leasing it from us. And uh, for the counselors that um, are not familiar with it, the students do um, end up with the, it's a, a dollar buyout at the end, and they do have to pay sales tax um, on the um, product at the end because obviously we're sales tax uh, free, but um, when a um, family buys it, it's not. Um, I don't have the numbers of like um, the scholarships and stuff, but what we do is um, on the scholarships, we do offer scholarships and that can be re uh, reassessed at any time. So if a family today is fully working and all of a sudden somebody gets laid off, they can come in with their documentation. They do have to prove um, their um, income with us, with their W-2s, most recent um, pay stubs. And the likewise, we expect that if people all of a sudden then do receive or get a job, that they come back to us for us to reassess that it may move them from a 60% off to a 40% off. Got it. Thank you. Two, oh, more, go ahead. two more quick, if I may. Um, so then I wanted to ask too, if there's been some looking into other programs and I'm, I'm channeling uh, my late neighbor here, Jim Ladder used to ask this question every year. So count the, the previous Ward 3 counselor, he just would always ask, have you looked into other other lease options, so why Apple, basically? Or have you reviewed that recently? Um, yeah. <clears throat> so the reason why we stick with Apple is that we are on a Mac platform um, um, for the answer to that. Um, and I don't think that as far as the educational part, that the instructional part, that they're looking to change any kind of app on that. Um, we do know that- so um, From some the teachers, kind of from the teacher's perspective, is that what you mean, or? Um, well, actually, it was before Gene Sherburn's time, so um, that okay. we've been actually when they chose that platform. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, pretty much we look at everything at all, all times. I mean, we look at programs, et cetera, et cetera, like that. So it's more of that that we look at as, you know, to be able to get the um, instructional out to the children and the okay. students. Um, we do go to Apple. I mean, they're offering this year the... Um, you know, no interest, which is, you know, fabulous. Yeah. Um, and we've been able to um, sustain the level of the, com of the laptop. So a lot of times when you get into, you know, like looking at copying machines, you know, sometimes you have to buy an inferior one to come out with the same price or a slower machine, which um, that's one area that with the laptops, we've been able to keep up with what's out there um, for the students. They are good machines. And then my last question just is, do you distribute all 300 every year or do you have some that kind yeah, of... Yeah, so what it is is that we get, we estimate, right now we're estimating when we get the quotes from them, 300. That's how much we usually um, have to get each year. So with this lease would be for the freshmen all the way to their senior year. Last year's will expire. So we're always rolling Okay. the three. And the numbers do come in the same. Pretty much every year, um, our enrollment has been increasing. So, um, and we do usually purchase a few extra for those people that do show up um, in September. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank Councilor Wren. Councilor Houseman. Yeah, I'll just be brief. Yeah, no, I think this. Uh, I would echo uh, Councilor Wren's comments about uh, Beverly being uh, ahead of the curve on on having a one-to-one -one program. I mean, computers are the pencil and paper of, 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 a, of an earlier generation, I'll say. Um, the, um, the 300 that, that are listed here, those are separate from, independent from the numbers that uh, are provided by Beverly Education Foundation, or, or is the funding from that group um, basically subsidize the digital divide within this set of 300? Right, so the Beverly Ed um, Foundation's amount would be a subsidizing for the, so, so the students that, you know, so some people, some students pay 100%, um, they get, they pay 60%, and then when it gets down to the 40, so what BevEd is, they, they're the one that is fund, helping us fund it the whole, because obviously we have to pay Apple the full price. 
So their funding comes in along with um, some of our own appropriated funds. And, and I just want to disclose I'm a former board member of Ed Ed and a current uh, non-voting you know, ad advisor. Um, and, and I don't think that uh, will, sort of disclosing for the record, I don't think that'll, uh, I'm able to take a vote on this without uh, it uh, affecting my, uh, having a bias for uh, of the vote that I can make an objective decision. Um, I, I fully support this program. I think it speaks for itself in terms of the benefits uh, to the school district and our, and our pupils. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor Houseman. Councilor Feldman. Thank you. Um, I just had one quick question. So this is a renewal of a four-year lease purchase that was similar to the one four year. We've had one going for the last four years, basically. Is that the way? Yeah, so, so last year, we, um, we, because of the pandemic, we were not able to get into a um, four year because we weren't meeting as city council. So what we did is we took uh, um, our hope that we had enough funds in our revolving account to pay, the, to pay Apple in three years, but the students pay us in four. Got it, okay. And then this is part of this line item will be built into the we haven't seen the i don't have the budget book in front of me but this is a line item in the, the school budget that yep so in yep so this is uh budgeting and are appropriated under um on the lease purchases okay. under our technology got it and that's only the differential you know so the the parents are paying 60 percent we're paying okay. um the opposite thank you thank you council feldman just quick council ames um, I just wanted to, I'm in the same boat as Councillor Houseman, as I'm a former board member for BevEd. Also, it's your Mac that got me through the pandemic on the city council meetings. It's still running strong, and this program made such a difference in his education. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Ann. Uh, thank you both for being here. Nice to see you in person. Thank you. Good to see you. Will we see you tomorrow, too? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I would entertain a motion to approve the request. So, so moved. moved. Second. <coughs> Joke on me. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero. <coughs> <coughs> you know this? It's really emotional. Yeah. Right, so <clears throat> give me a sec. I'll worry. Okay. <laughs> Lisa, are you able to admit? I want to know where the counselors from board. Dog world up there. <laughs> There's ice up there. It's really cool. Stacy, you're right. I like those shorts. I hate those. Falling shorts. Pants. Pants. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, my goodness. You're here? Can we cancel them? I'm yeah. walking out right now. I keep now. saying no. Hello, Wayno. <clears throat> my wife picked it out for me. What's up? Yeah, listen, I, I took it, I took it off the corpse of a body on the way here. I took it off the corpse of a body on the way here. I don't know. Uh, well, we don't know who they are, so, and there was people, but there was people trying What's to get that? in earlier that Robert was having yeah. a couch.
It is a little after 8 o'clock. We have a joint public hearing with the Planning Board. Ms. Kent, could you please read Order Number 110? Order Number 110, Legal Notice for the City of Beverly. Notice is hereby given in accordance with MGL Chapter 40A, Section 5, that the Beverly City Council and Beverly Planning Board will hold a joint public hearing on Monday, June 7, 2021, at 8 p.m. in the City Council Chambers, City Hall, 3rd Floor, 191 Cabot Street in Beverly. Relative to a proposed amendment to the zoning map, rezoning map 52, lot 75, currently zoned CG and R-10 to IR, and rezoning a portion of map 52, lot 14, located within the city of Beverly, which is 19,024 plus square feet, currently zoned RSD to IR, referred to in zoning ordinance chapter 300, article 8, 7. Copies of the proposed amendment are on file in the planning department in the city clerk's office and are available for public viewing. And this was in the newspaper on May 21st and May 31st. Thank you, Ms. Kent. And I will ask um, Chairman Hutchinson to come up and join me, or are you going to run it from there? I can do it from here. I'm fine here. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I don't have a mic. Oh, okay. No, that's okay. Over there, then? Uh, she can sit over here. Uh, all right. Thank you. Copeland. Yes, Copeland. Or do you want... Do you want me to move and she can say you give that to Emily? She can usually sit sits next to me though. Should we should yeah. down? Yeah. This is, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. This is, I don't know what she has in the age. I know what's cool. Yeah, don't come down. That's okay. You can sit at my channel. Order. 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 Is it? Come on, Ella. We may not have many more, many of these left, you and I. So. You know how to navigate. Thank you. Over here. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. And um, just for everybody. I will. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Special meeting of the Beverly Planning Board is called to order. Uh, we have one member who is participating remotely, so I need to uh, call the call the roll for everyone to confirm their attendance, and all of our votes tonight, if there's any, will be done by uh, roll call. Uh, members, when I read your name, just confirm. Okay, uh, Vice Chairman Alexander Kraft. Present. Thank you. Sarah Bartley, remotely? Yes. Was that a yes from Sarah? I heard that. Thank you. Derek Beckwith? Present. Thank you. Ellen Flannery? Present. Wayne Miller? Present. Thank you. Rodney Sinclair? Rodney's not with us this evening <clears throat> or running late. Uh, Brendan Sweeney? Present. Thank you. Andrea Toulouse. And I am Ellen Hutchinson. Thank you. I'd welcome a, a vote, please. I'm sorry, a motion, please, to recess for the public hearing. Can I have a Second. seconded by Mr. Beckwith? Calling the roll. Alexander Kraft? Yes. Sarah Bartley? Yes. Thank you. Derek Beckwith? Yes. Ellen Flannery? Yes. Wayne Miller? Yes. Brendan Sweeney? Yes. Andrea Toulouse? Yes. Ellen Hutchinson, yes, motion passes. We are now, planning board is now in public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson. And let's go right to our planning, dir our director of planning, Ms. Darlene Wynn. Correct. Ms. Wynn. Thank you, this is my first in-person meeting as planning director. Um, so as the letter from the mayor stated, we are proposing, the city has agreed to submit a zoning change, a map change to an area of land that is currently zoned IR. The primary change is, I is sorry, CG to IR. Um, but as you can see from that map, and I'll, I'll show a larger size of that map, the actual area that's owned by, in common by the same person there uh, is three different zones. There's a little bit of R10 on the parcel, and then there's an adjacent RSD sliver. Um, so we're looking to simplify it by changing that entire section to IR. Um, the administration, the city and the previous planning director had been working with the landowner there who is self-signaling technology to identify an area in Beverly where they could relocate and build a, a more campus-like structure. They have a, a need to expand um, their business, including more employees and more land, air, more area of development for uh, expansion of their business. They really wanted to do that in Beverly and we really wanted to work with them. We were not able to find a parcel that really met the needs of the company. Um, and so the next solution we looked at um, and entertained with them was a zoning change um, as discussed in this, for this parcel. The reason that we believe this zoning map change is beneficial to the city is because it will generate additional tax revenue 
and keep a, a really excellent corporate citizen in the city as well as help them grow their life science business. We also realize that this is beneficial to the current property owner to help them achieve their goals of expanding their business. Um, the property owner, in addition, it's beneficial to the abutters in the neighborhood because they have agreed to make additional commitments beyond what the zoning change would afford them, um, and they've agreed to provide this mitigation to abutters. I'm going to let them describe that in more detail. So if this zoning change is approved, they would consent to um, a development agreement that would restrict those additional uh, parameters uh, and carry with the landowner. So they would carry, even if this property owner were to, be, to move out, they would still be in place. Sorry, with the land, not the owner. Um, so on face, the proposed zoning change alone is simple and we believe favorable uh, when considering the abutter's perspective because it is um, currently under the CG zoning the side and rear setbacks are only 15 feet. Uh, the building height is 35 feet, and that's the one area where it is more favorable to be zoned IR. Um, and currently under the CG zoning, there's no site plan review required. So they could propose their, they could propose their expansion 15 feet from the neighboring residential area, single family residential area, um, and it doesn't require city review, the way our zoning is currently written. So they are willingly um, opting to uh, request a change to the IR zoning. It will give them additional height under the existing ordinance. Um, and, but it will also require that their setbacks have to be greater, just as is on face. Um, and it will opt them into the site plan review process, which requires planning board review, a public hearing, um, a butter notice, um, and many other things such as stormwater management records and traffic analysis. So um, that in itself, I think is important to the city and beneficial. In addition, as I mentioned, the developer or the property owner has agreed to additional restrictions. They're willing to limit the setback to 50 feet rather than the 15 or the 20 uh, on the side setback and 60 feet on the rear rather than the 15 or 25. Um, they're also willing to limit the height to 50 feet rather than the 60 feet that they would be allowed under the IR. Um, and they will continue the, um, to go for site plan review, review by the planning board and other boards and commissions in the city that review site plan review. Um, and I think these, we agree that these commitments will provide the abutters with greater protection than they would normally get under the IR zoning district or the CR, great, much greater than in the CG zoning district, um, and protect them against future uncertainty. Um, the agreement, as I said, will run with the property, um, and we think will be mutually beneficial to both the city, um, the abutters, and as well as keep uh, what we believe is to be an excellent corporate citizen in the city of Beverly. <coughs> oh, and I did add this, map. so it's, that's the map a little bit bigger, it's still hard to see, but. And with that, I was going to ask um, Peter Bordeaux, from, who's representing Cell Signaling Technology, to go into a little bit more detail. That's Thank fine. you, Ms. Wynn. Yep. Good evening, Mr. President and members of the council and members of the planning board. My name is Peter Gordeau and I'm a development advisor working with cell signaling technology. Um, this evening, I am accompanied by uh, Matt Curran, CFO of uh, cell signaling, Peter Budo, director of facilities, Chris Combe, uh, director at cell signaling and Mark Glovsky, uh, our attorney. And am I allowed to take off my mask or? Thank you. Sure. I have a hard enough time talking without it, so. Uh, this evening, first of all, uh, Darlene gave most of my presentation and she did a better job than I probably will, so I will try and make this as brief as I can. Um, what I would like to do this evening is share a little bit of information about cell signaling and their need to expand. 
why we think that the current CG zoning, primarily CG zoning, probably would not result in the best outcome, both for cell signaling and for the neighbors, and why IR would result in a better outcome. Cell signaling was founded in 1999 uh, by Michael Combe and other scientists. Uh, they set out to create the best antibody technology in the world. Uh, CST makes products that help researchers um, find cures to diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. They make, uh, they make the products that help the researchers do their work. They make the highest quality uh, product, and that certainty offers uh, many advantages to the scientific community. Beyond, our CST is now a 550-person uh, company with offices around the world. Uh, in Beverly, the company maintains two facilities, one on Tozier Road and one on Trask Lane, where they do production and R&D, respectively. Uh, but beyond its research, the company also maintains a deep commitment uh, to the well-being of its employees, to the environment, and the community. <clears throat> In addition to being a good corporate citizen, uh, CST is growing. Uh, CST estimates that it needs to bring on an additional 200 people over the next 10 years. Those 200 people uh, are going to need labs and offices where they can uh, do their work. Uh, we believe that Trask Lane does offer the opportunity uh, to meet their expansion needs. We've looked elsewhere around the North Shore and I would commend the mayor and Darlene and the rest of the administration because uh, they've helped us uh, make the decision that this is, that Trask Lane is the best place for cell signaling to expand. For those of you who are familiar with cell signaling's Trask Lane facility, it's the uh, site of the former King's Grant Inn, which was a 125 room motor inn. Uh, it is accessed only by Route 128 north. Um, it's an 11 acre site. It's divided approximately half in Danvers and half in Beverly. Uh, the build, the CST currently has about 110,000 square feet of building there. And as I say, the zoning is CG, primarily CG. CG was established to provide principally for suburban and automotive related commercial development. Some of the allowed uses include hotel, motel, retail, health clubs, funeral homes, fast food, skating rinks, R&D, bus terminals, and car washes. Um, the field to the east, is where you can see the arrow, is the logical direction for CST to expand. Uh, obviously, it's an undeveloped portion of the site, and development in that portion of the site enables the balance of CST's facility to continue operation um, as uninterrupted as possible, and that is a critical element for CST. The neighborhood, you have the Cornell and Oberlin neighborhoods to the east, and you have the Folly Hill Meadows apartments to the south, uh, and 128, obviously, to the north. This is an example of, Darlene mentioned that this is CG zoning and the setbacks are 15 feet. This is a good example of what an 80,000 square foot expansion uh, and a parking garage would look like potentially under CG. Uh, because the site would, would contain less than 65% uh, site coverage, it would not require site plan review. Therefore, there'd be very little uh, public input to you know, design elements, uh, traffic, all those important aspects of planning that we sometimes take for granted. <clears throat> we think that the better approach here is to uh, alter the zoning from CG to IR. And these are a couple of zoning maps, which I didn't realize it was going to be quite that small. But this is, a, uh, this is a look at a section of your zoning map. You can see, the, you can see the, the CST site with a star on it on the left-hand side on the Danvers border. Above that in red is the IR district, which goes into Cherry Hill. Below it, the RSD in green. And to the right, uh, the R10 residential district in pink. This is the actual CST parcel. It consists, uh, you can see that about half of it's in Beverly, and in Beverly you have uh, CG, R10, and RSD zones. Uh, Danvers is industrial one. This is a, a conceptual rendering of what a project might look like under IR. 
the biggest advantage to IR is that by the ability to go up one story uh, to exceed the 30 foot, 35 foot height limit of the CG district enables us to shrink the footprint, pull the building back from the property line uh, only by, you know, and, and the, the cost is a mere 10 feet of height. We have, uh, we have shared this site plan with some of our neighbors. I, I want to say that I commend the, the management of CST because from the beginning, um, how this project would impact the neighborhood uh, has been central to their, uh, their deliberations. And we have heard, we've presented uh, our, our need to expand and some of the concepts that you'll see tonight to the neighbors. We've begun to hear some of their concerns, all of which are reasonable, things like noise, air quality, uh, protection of existing easements and privacy and lighting are all uh, elements of, of a, a planning process that we would expect. Um, we, would, we, we believe that the proper time to address those is during the site plan review process, which we are uh, obviously going to, if we're successful, we would subject ourselves to. Um, at this point, this is not a design, this is not a site plan, this is not a building design, this is a concept. Um, we have not yet engaged an architect who would take us through the programming and, and design process. This chart, uh, this chart presents the existing, some of the, some of the key dimensional elements of your zoning. Uh, first under CG, uh, then under IR, the, second, the third column is the IR, setbacks and, or dimensional requirements. And the, the last column is the, is the limitation that CST is willing to self-impose in an effort to uh, provide comfort to the neighbors uh, going forward. So the, outside of this, the CG and IR dimensional regulations are actually quite similar. Uh, but the side setback, which is currently 15 feet, uh, would be 20 feet under IR, but we would commit to a 50-foot setback along the south. That's along the apartment, uh, the, the Folly Hill apartment side. The rear setback, which is also 15 feet today, would be 25 under IR, but we would commit to a 60-foot setback. Uh, the maximum building height would be, is currently 35 feet. The reason we need to, the, one of the reasons we're seeking relief here is that uh, 35 feet would provide most businesses a three-story building. Labs are a different animal. They need 15 feet floor to floor, floor to meet current design standards. So a three-story building is by definition, you know, 45 feet. So that's, that, that, that sort of explains why we can't get three stories in 35 feet when most, most businesses can. Um, so we don't need the 60 feet that would be offered by IR. Uh, we only need those three stories. So we're saying 50 feet, that allows us to have a 45 foot building and a site that falls off as it goes towards 128. Um, but, and we've spoken with the building inspector and feel comfortable that the 15 feet will meet our needs definitionally. Uh, obviously, site plan review, not currently required, would be required under IR. And the buffer yard is, and I'll show you, uh, show you a plan in a minute, but there, both IR and CG call for a buffer yard um, we, the first, our, our, our first uh, effort at trying to meet the needs of the neighbors was to, provide, pro was to create and design a very dense evergreen buffer that would be between, uh, between cell signaling's new facility and the neighbors on the Oberlin uh, side of the property. And that, I'll, sh I'll show it to you in a minute, I think it comes up next. So that would be an enhanced buffer. Uh, I think that in addition to uh, the considerations of our neighborhood, there's also a bigger picture. Uh, so there's some bigger picture considerations here, which are the potential economic impact of this. The, the, two, the two CST facilities currently have a tax base to the city of about 12.8 billion, producing just north of $300,000 annually in tax revenue. Uh, this new project, we believe, would at a minimum, triple that revenue to the city. Uh, we think that the assessed value conservatively would, would be at least $25 million. And using today's tax rates, 
uh, that would result in more than $900,000 worth of revenue annually. Also, I may have mentioned that they expect to hire an additional 200 people over the next 10 years. Uh, most of those people will live here, will live on the North Shore. They may live in Beverly. Currently, there are 74 employees who work for CST out of the 550 uh, who do live in Beverly. So there is a significant economic ripple. Uh, you know, the, the lunch is out during the day down to the homes purchased for new employees. So there's a significant, I, couldn't begin to quantify that, uh, but it's not insignificant. So I am going to just go back because I wanted to point out the buffer yard, then I promise I will wrap up. Uh, to the, the, the green section that you see to the right of building A and extending all the way down to the garage uh, is, a, is a 120 tree uh, plan of three types of evergreens, which we've worked with a landscape designer on. Uh, mature trees, 16 to 18 foot trees placed strategically in ways that we think will help uh, mitigate any visual impact to the neighbors. We have also, uh, through Councilor Rotundo, reached out to uh, the, the four or five direct abutters to let them know that uh, if we can help by providing fencing or trees on their property, we are more than happy to do so. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Boudreau. Uh, members of the City Council with questions. I saw Councilor Rotundo's hand go up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Peter, a couple of things. Yes, uh, CST has been great getting out the uh, information to the neighbors. Uh, he, they had an uh, informational meeting with the neighbors. Um, they've been very responsive with the questions. The McKennas, the Driscolls, and the uh, Ponzinis have been really uh, vocal with some concerns. but. Any questions that have been brought have been forwarded to the planning department as well as to CST because they are in the planning or even the conceptual phase. Um, you know, what Peter just said was in regards to maybe a couple of shrubberies in the backyard, perimeter fencing. Um, so it's been a very favorable relationship right now. I did have one question for you, Peter, just because of while I've had these conversations with the, the neighbors and um, selling, or not selling them, but kind of stating, and I don't want to be called a liar or misinformation. We've been talking about the 45 feet, and I know right now you're presenting at 50 feet. So is the building still planned as a 45 foot with the uh, utilities on top of all the cooling units and stuff? Or are you still looking at 50 feet now and then going above that? Just because we had kind of mentioned that at some sure. of our meetings. So, so two di there's two different, parts, uh, two different parts of the building there. So the building itself, from, from the grade at the, let me, let me go back and this may be helpful. So the two buildings you see there in gray, uh, the one labeled, if I can read it properly, is G is a garage, and A is a lab building. Uh, the lab building is 45 feet tall at the end closest to the garage. The site is relatively flat as, it, as, you, as you proceed towards Route 128 to the top of the page, but it begins to drop off as it gets closer to 128. So the building, the roof is still at 45 feet, if you will, but there's some basement wall exposed at the far end. And your calculation for height uh, involves taking the original grade at the four corners of the building. So we need, so we will be at say 53, 52, 45, 45. The, the math works out to be at say 48 feet. That's why we need the 50 feet. We think of this as a 45 foot three story building. Uh, but it's just because of what the grades do at the north end of the site. And then one other just statement, just so I can have it on the record, is um, doing the conceptual. I know we've had these conversations with the option A and option B, option A having the what I call the valley between the, the garage and the building, as well as having a solid wall and where the planning department's in front of us, or the planning board. Um, I know the neighbors are more favorable to plan, uh, option A that you presented, which is the valley in between as opposed to the solid wall just for natural light as well as that breeze that may come and come. So those are just some of the concerns as the neighbors had um, reiterated to me. And, and, and that's incredibly helpful to us to have that feedback because that, that allows us to move in that direction. Um, and, and so that's why that's the plan that we've presented tonight. So again, what you see there is a lab building in A, 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 a physically separate garage, G. There is a bridge at the third level. Uh, you know, a suspect, there is a, a walkway up, up in the air that gets you from G to A, uh, but the buildings are separated, which does allow, you know, light and air to pass through. 
Uh, you also asked about the mechanical penthouse that would be on the roof. Yes. So uh, your zoning, as is typical, allows for a mechanical penthouse on the roof of a building that exceeds the, in this case, proposed 50-foot height limit. Um, we would also have, we would need a, a mechanical penthouse. Uh, it would probably be 12 feet in height. It would be an enclosed structure. It would contain mechanical equipment, uh, heating, ventilating, air conditioning equipment. Uh, it is vented, we would, we would vent it away from the Oberlin neighborhoods and probably you know, towards the Danvers side. Uh, it would also exhaust uh, straight up. We cannot exceed one of the concerns from <coughs> mechanical equipment on the roof would be noise. Um, I think that I can pretty safely, again, we, you know, we, don't, we don't have a design or a specification or anything yet, uh, but I think you will find that this equipment will be enclosed. It will be quieter than the existing than, than equipment that you know, currently they may be, the neighbors may be able to hear. Um, also, we, we've, we've come to the realization that noise may be mitigated somewhat by the fact that this building will act as a buffer from the 128 noise, which we think may turn out to be a positive. Thank you. And those are some of the other things that were mentioned. And I know you didn't have exact answers at the time, but these are things that some of the neighbors, as you're aware, were mentioning was the noise from the um, equipment on the roof and things of that nature that you've addressed. So I appreciate that. And again, like I said, I just want to state that, uh, and I don't know if any of the uh, abutters are on the call, but. Um, I do want to state that you guys have been extremely responsive to the questions that have been asked by the neighbors. Um, they appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm sure the mayor as well. So I do want to say is it's been a pleasure, at least in this aspect of the project, working with you and being able to give them full explanations to know what's going on. So thank you. We, we very much appreciate uh, the way you've acted to facilitate between us. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rotundo. Councilor Feldman. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I have two questions, and the first is, I think, pretty simple. The, the voluntary setbacks that you've proposed, uh, do those, through the development agreement, do those follow the land, or do they follow, okay, so those. They would, they would run with the land. Those, okay, just checking on that. And then, I'm just out of curiosity, I know that you want to expand and hire more and you, more employees, and um, you mentioned 74 of the employees being from Beverly. I was just wondering if you had any hiring priorities that you internally have been working on at Cell Signaling. I know, I know a lot of companies have those um, either diversity or equity or you know location, geographic location. I'm just wondering if, if you have any priorities in place. So I am absolutely the wrong person to speak <laughs> to that, but I would be more than happy to get that information for you and follow up. Um, it has not been, I, my focus has been on, on the real estate side of this, uh, but we can, we, there are very, CST is a very progressive company and I would be willing to bet that there is such a, uh, such a hiring priority. Yeah, just, it was just a curiosity question, so thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Feldman. Councilor Flowers, please. Thank you. Uh, I had just two questions, if I may. The first was, um, I'm curious about the parcel of land that's in Danvers and is zoned, you said industrial one. Um, is, that, is that an option for expansion if we were not willing to uh, rezone our section? Or I guess I'm also curious how their zoning for industrial one compares to what's possible with an IR overlay here. I'm not aware of any reason why expansion on the Danvers side of the property would not be available to us. Does that answer your question? Well, I guess my question was sort of if, um, if we were to not inclined, I know we saw what would be the buy right development, but um, I'm thinking about the, the tax base, Ms. Wynn mentioned you know, having a great corporate citizen, but also taxes for, uh, for, for Beverly. And so just trying to sort of think about is there a possibility that if we were to sort of not want to rezone that Danvers would become more desirable to go in that direction. It, it, it's, certainly, it's certainly possible. I think that we have, you know, from the beginning gravitated to this portion of the site in large part because we're able to construct the new facilities with as little disruption to the existing operation as possible. Um, and I, I may have, I was trying to go through my presentation quickly and I may have skipped over it, but CST's needs are 80 to 100,000 square feet over the next 10 years. We believe that the, that's an 80,000 square foot building that you see there. We believe that this will meet their mid to long term needs um, at this facility. Thank you. And just to clarify my own understanding, 
the slide that you showed that was the, the buy right um, development that could happen even without the rezoning. Um, so that basically would be if we decide to take no action, that is the way that the site could potentially look in that case. Exactly right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Houseman. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening and thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of, of, of reflections and, and, and one question. Um, uh, my experience as a, as a city councilor over the years has been that uh, cell signaling has been an excellent um, corporate citizen for, this, for the city, uh, participating in many community, supporting many community uh, in, endeavors. Um, and uh, I, I think that the, the proposal you have and, and uh, the report from Councillor uh, Rotunda regarding the uh, and the administration regarding the you know the the community outreach uh, speaks highly of of this uh, of cell signaling and, and this process that you're engaged in, uh, as well as obviously the you know the tax benefits to the to the city. Um, so I'm very favorably disposed to this. Um, so my, my questions really are um, have to do with sort of community standards that the city. Uh, aspires to, one of which is energy sustainability um, and uh, the plan cell signaling would have around, uh, uh, you know, sort of carbon neutral, uh, carbon, net, net carbon zero uh, um, construction. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other is a sort of a more uh, philosophical question, but given the heat, I don't really want to belabor the point, and it's really a, a, a question for uh, our planning director probably, uh, which is, um, as we attract and keep, hopefully, uh, businesses like self-signaling in our city, uh, where the employee base typically is a higher, uh, um, higher, higher um, salaried uh, employee, how that has sort of an effect on affordable housing in the city. So I think that's, if, if uh, Ms. Wynn is willing to answer that question this evening on the fly, I'm, I'd be happy to listen to it. If you'd rather reflect and get back to me, I, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm mindful of the temperature in this room right now. So, but I will, but I, but I do want to ask you about the, the energy sustainability uh, um, uh, goals for this expansion. So, thank you. And we have not yet, so first of all, uh, cell signaling, sustainability, environmental sustainability is a central ethos at CST. Uh, we have not yet gotten to the point in the design process where we have um, spent much time talking about whether we would uh, do a, let's say, a lead, silver, gold, platinum type of building. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, I can tell you that there will be uh, solar panels on the roof of the garage and that, uh, that cell signaling has a very aggressive program, uh, incentive program, incenting their personnel to purchase electric vehicles, sort of putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, there, I think there are more EV chargers in those two parking lots than there are anywhere else on the North Shore. Um, I don't, Matt, would you like to, is there anything I should add to, we, we, we haven't gotten to talking about what level of sustainability this building will be at is the is the is the honor yeah it's really sort of a goal uh, that you know our commitment you know sort of internally obviously you're the, getting way ahead in terms of actual design mm -hmm. but conceptually the commitment of the company to to uh, to that design I, I pulled up while we were talking a uh, Google aerial view I, it doesn't look like presently you have any solar panels but I, you know I can't really tell from that so I, I just don't know where the company is. Uh, in, in terms of, of solid commitments to to a to a building that would reflect those values, I, I'm just getting. I, I I believe that there there are solar panels at both Trask and Tozier, and getting the confirmation nod I, from. I, I can't tell from this, so I, yeah. I mean, certainly not um, asserting that that's not I, the case. I, yeah. I, I, I think when we when we get to that point in the in the discussion, because obviously it's a it's a. The sustainability is a function of, you have function, program, yeah. cost, they all have to sure. get, get mashed together into a workable model, uh, but if, if what I see day to day from cell signaling is any indication, uh, there will be a high commitment to sustainability in the construction okay. of this building. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Houseman. Ms. Wynn? You gave you an out. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, 
lot of time. He I doesn't think. always do that. <laughs> Council Houseman, I think it's a great question. I will just, I would like to think more about it and have further conversation with you about it. I think I would point to, you know, one of the goals of our new master plan is a diverse workforce and a diverse employment base. And I think yeah. that is that is a goal and something we have to strive for and work towards so that we can support a range of, of incomes and create jobs for people at all spectrums. Um, and some things come to mind, but I think it would be worth putting, you know, having a deeper conversation about that, uh, definitely. Sure. But I, I think it's certainly not lost on us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good start, Ms. Wynn. Um, anybody on the left? Okay, the council has asked their questions. We'll turn this over to Ms. Hutchinson. Are there members of the planning board who have questions for Mr. Goudreau or Ms. Wynn? Derek? Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I, uh, first of all, want to make sure that I know what I'm looking at when I look at the chart here. So if you could tell me what B and X are on the plan and whether you have a plot that you can actually pull up that shows um, anything larger and um, is superimposed with the zoning change. Yeah, I think if I understand your question correctly. Two questions there, actually. Okay, so this is the entire, let me see if I'm understanding your question yeah. correctly. This is the 11.1 .1 acre cell signaling parcel at three to nine Trask Lane. That's right. Uh, what you see in white is in Danvers. What you see in gray blue is currently CG, yellow is R10 and RNG is RSD. That all, all that you see in those three colors would become IR. Yep. Um, so I think my question is gonna be of uh, Ms. Wynn actually um, first. And that is, uh, as I look at the map, uh, knowing that the people who um, originally put the zoning map together in our last go around probably had a method to the madness. I'm curious about the R10 um, district that, that's in there right now as zoned for this land as to whether or not it was meant to be a buffer um, between CG, RSD, and the other areas. I mean, that can't just miraculously leave, you know, be a sliver that was purposely made R10, I don't think it's big enough for anything to go in there. I, I mean, I had the same question, um, although it is not uniform in size, um, which is a little perplexing, but uh, there, there is no buffer on that section. So there is, the RSD was created with a buffer of 200 feet along the edge of it. The buffer does not apply on that side of the RSD. Um, I don't really, I don't have a history as to how that was put in place. We don't. I, I, I would like to think that everything has an intent. I can't say that everything always does have an intent. Um, it could have been a remnant um, of, of something else left over. The whole other adjacency is RSD. Um, there is nothing uh, in the CG that would be allowed differently being adjacent to an R10 versus an RSD, if that makes sense. No, could you actually? Help me out with that. What did you? What so, did, like uh, in in some of our zoning districts, like the CC, it says if it's adjacent to a residential zoning district, you yeah. can only do X. But yeah. if it's adjacent to a commercial use or commercial district, you can do X and Y. In the CG, there's nothing. There isn't anything that is is dependent on the adjacent zone or use. If that makes sense. It's it's pretty straightforward zoning district. Um, they both, it's actually very similar to the IR, where they both have very similar buffer yards built into the zoning yeah. themselves. Well, there is the requirement in our current bylaws, or uh, zoning regulations, that said that if a CG um, abuts an R district, um, that there has to be an adequate buffer yard adjoining the district yep. to screen light, glare, parking lots, all that sort of stuff. So it yep. does go to a buffer yard having to exist, right? Right, but both R10 and RSD are our, our districts, I think. I would interpret them as residential districts, but. The RSD then yeah. would do that. Okay, I had a question about, um, and these are minor right now, I'm just trying to get my head around this. Um, the little triangular sliver um, that comes down at the very bottom of the site there. Um, I'm just uh, trying to figure that out. Is that, that abuts, that we're, the request is to change it to an IR zone. Um, is that just so that all the owned property is under the same zoning? Yes. Not because there's anything in particular planned for that. We, we, we do not 
we do not envision anything happening in that section. Okay, so that's one set of um, questions, so thank you for that. Um, the other is in terms of the differences, um, is when if you could help me out uh, between our CG or our IR and the Danvers Industrial One, um, what the requirements, are there any differences in um, limitations um, that would come into play here? Um, I don't have the I one. I don't have the Danvers I one for me. I know Peter had it. Uh, they were. They're very. I, when I looked at them, it's very similar to our IR district. There may be some small changes, uh, you know, minor things, but the nature of the zoning districts are very similar. Peter's got handy little chart. Yeah, handy dandy little chart. So, are there any specific? What I have is some of the dimensional regulations of the districts compared. Are there any? Would you like setbacks, height? What would height you, first? Height? Uh, the building height in the in the I district in Danvers is 60 feet. It's 60 feet. Okay. Uh, let me hang on. Let me just check that because I, I made me higher. I take that back. It's 55 feet. Four stories. Five feet. 55 feet. Okay. So it's in and around the same. And then, um, but you're really looking to expand on the Beverly side here, or to build on the Beverly side, not on the Danvers side. Um, so if we can go back to the um, the conceptualized uh, drawing. So what B and X on this? Uh, your eyes may work better than mine. Oh, here we go. B. Uh, so B is just a connector from the existing facility to the new building, and X is the existing building. X is the existing building down there. So this is really. Yeah, so what you see well in the, the darker north, gray yeah. are the are are proposed, and and B is also proposed. That connector is also proposed. B is also another, um, okay. Um, and can you, it, I was out there today actually. Um, what a beautiful day to be out under the tent having lunch. Um, I wasn't, I was watching other people do that. Um, but I saw the buffer um, of trees that runs um, along uh, the eastern border here. Mm -hmm. And it seems very thick. Um, it's deciduous trees, so there wouldn't be very much coverage, I don't think, during um, the fall and winter and early spring. But is that represented in here, or are, um, would a conceptualized plan in order to do something on this site um, eat into that uh, buffer as it is just right now? So the proposed buildings do not eat into the buffer. Uh, we don't want to, we want to preserve as much of that deciduous buffer as possible, and it, most of it's along the property line, so I think there's very little of it that would be impacted by the, by the building construction. Uh, but I think this plan may be helpful. But we, because we're trying to create a visual buffer, uh, we feel the need to supplement it with, uh, with evergreen trees and to, to plant, to create the proper conditions for the planting of the evergreens, there will be some cutting of understory and other things, but not the, not the large deciduous trees. Let me, let me go to a plan that I just sort of kept in reserve in case it was helpful. Um, so here you see a formal planting plan of literally 120 trees. Um, all, you can see how they relate to the proposed buildings. And those are how we're using the enhanced buffer zone. Uh, they'd all be native species. Uh, to the east along Oberlin, uh, they'd be 16 to 18 foot trees. Along the south where that, that the benefit of height is not as great, they'd uh, probably be closer to eight to 10 foot trees. And we have confirmed that both fencing and offsite trees are something that we're more than happy to do. Uh, we think that a, a, tree, a tree or two strategically located in a neighbor's backyard where they might like it uh, will be worth 10 trees on our side of the parcel because of the way some of the grades work. Mm -hmm. And would you say the, uh, I guess the south side, the eight to 10 foot trees, that basically follows the existing fence that's there, I think? Yes. Right? Okay. Um, how many parking um, places do you have on the site existing right now? Oh, you're going to test my memory. Um, I don't have that at my fingertips. I apologize. Okay. Um, how many do you anticipate the um, um, being added if there are 200 new jobs? 200 spots? Uh, that garage will be somewhere between 280 and 360 spaces we anticipate. 
Uh, have you done any traffic impact or um, uh, any sort of analysis on this? We, we have not done that yet. That's obviously something that will be coming should we uh, be fortunate enough to proceed further. Knowing your existing um, employees and their, um, their parking and driving habits, um, I've, I've heard uh, people make mention of the 1A interchange. I take it that's mostly for turnaround uh, for employees who are leaving and have to go northbound on 128, so they turn around on that next exit mm -hmm. um, and that sort of thing. And do you have any estimate as to uh, employee, you know, visits, use, um, time of day, et cetera, exists now on that interchange? Uh, we don't, I, do, I don't have traffic data for the interchange. I don't know whether Darlene or uh, I know that the mayor at one point was speaking about that, but. No, I, I don't. I know because I think that's the, tra the traffic data will be the same regardless of which project they build. Um, allegedly, they're, they have told me, and I feel comfort that with the kind of new journey to work um, information and also kind of the, the priority that they put on sustainability, that there are some flexibility options within cell signaling's uh, employment workforce and also you know, staggered arrivals and times so that not everybody's arriving at nine o'clock and leaving at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, they have been interested partners in alternative modes of transportation. I believe cell signaling has a, a higher percentage of people who ride their bikes to work than maybe many other businesses that operate in Beverly and have also participated in our shuttle program in the past. So I think the exploring ways, continuing to explore ways to reduce the impacts of the trash lane intersection on the adjacent intersections is a, is a major city priority that you know, will need. But we don't have numbers right now. It's not, no, that would come during the site plan review. Which yeah, during the site plan review, which would happen after this was approved. Correct, but if, okay. they, if this is not approved, they don't actually have to go to site plan review. No, so. um, they couldn't build a three-story three building here at a 35-foot limit, though, right? Correct. I mean, what, what, so what the what that the plan of what we don't want to do showed was a 30 foot tall building that had 80,000 square feet and it was just a two story lab building instead of a three story lab building. But because the footprint's bigger, you end up pushing closer to the neighbors and that sort of thing. So yes, the 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 cell signaling needs could be met on site, but when we showed the management team, you know, how that would impact the neighbors, it was a non-starter. What else can we do? Well, we can go up, mm -hmm. but. To go up, we need to come here. Yeah, I'm just, you know, the reason I have a lot of questions here, I think, is in part because it's only very recently, well after the, the joint um, hearing was scheduled, that actually I think I became aware, mostly within the last few days, of what this is about. Um, because originally, as I read the letter, it was about um, having uh, the zoning in the area uh, be similar to the Cherry Hill Industrial Park. That's what's in the cover letter for this. This seems like it's a different occasion. Not that it's not important or merit meritorious at all. It's just a different set of circumstances and facts to investigate and look at it if this is an, um, a zoning request on behalf of a specific entity rather than an overall policy of the city for making our zoning um, correlate with each other in different segments of the city. It, it's a completely different question to me. Yeah, I think it's our local goal. I mean, we might not have gone around and, and, you know, we could have gone through an exercise of picking out all the, the kind of zoning areas that don't conform to, you know, that stand out as this kind of single parcel or a couple parcels. Um, that's not the exercise we went through. We had an, an opportunity and a discussion with somebody who was looking to do something with their land and noticing that this change would make it more consistent with the zoning across the street. It's a similar type of use, a similar type of, of use that we would see staying there and that it, it, it didn't, it wasn't random. It made sense. Um, if, if there was no IR anywhere around, I don't, I don't know if we would have supported the change, but I think because it is making it consistent, that was one of the reasons why we thought it made sense and it was justifiable. It, and I'm not discounting it. I'm just saying that, you know, this is a, a yeah, bigger, yeah. bigger issue than I thought it was originally in terms of, you know, looking, looking at all of the ins and outs um, of it 
from this particular viewpoint? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, sometimes these things do come up that are, many times, we get asked to do things that are not necessarily, uh, have not been specified or laid out in, in a policy to that nature way ahead of time or in a plan. We have to evaluate each of those things on a case-by-case -case basis and weigh the benefits to the, the city and the community on the whole and, and come to a decision as to whether we think it makes sense and whether it's something that we can stand behind. Um, there certainly are, are things that we've, we've said, no, we don't think that we can support that um, for various reasons, but this was something that um, seemed to be beneficial to all parties that were going to be impacted. Yeah, and I'm not disagreeing um, yeah, with that. that, that kind of I, but I also haven't had time to read the nine-page document that came before, which maybe will spell this stuff out in more detail. I, I'm not quite sure. So, uh, the one that came before the meeting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the development agreement is, um, I know, I think Stephanie Williams was on and perhaps wants to talk, on, would speak on it, but that was something that, as, as we mentioned, you know, it, it wasn't good enough for us, for the developer to say, I'll do these things. We knew that if they were making these commitments, we needed them to be in writing um, and to carry with the land. And so that was something that we asked them to put together. Um, it, as I kind of tried to point out, the just changing the zoning to IR would be beneficial. Um, but this is kind of another layer that provides more certainty to the neighbors. Um, I don't, it's very much a legal document. Um, I, I understand that you probably want to read it, but the parameters that were listed, the dimensional parameters that were listed on the presentation are that, those that are included in there. So. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I, I apologize. I've taken far too much time here. Um, and uh, I'm interested to hear from the neighbors after um, the other committee members have a chance. Actually, Darlene, can, while we're on the topic, just that triangular piece, Beverly's GIS shows that the subject parcel owned by uh, CST is, is, does not include that RSD triangle. Is the, is the GIS wrong or Correct. the GIS is wrong? Yes, they're okay. going through the process to have that fixed. They, they, CST acquired that parcel when they bought the property um, and for some reason it didn't show up. So they have the deeds and the, and the, the title to show that. Um, it just, our GIS is updated every six months. So. Is there a potential impact on the remaining RSD land that would be to the right of it by pulling that piece out of RSD and turning it into the uh, IR? I don't believe so. Uh, the, uh, yeah. yeah, no, that's additional I RSD, which is already um, non-conforming to the RSD. Um, so. Uh, there's not much additional development potential at that site, um, but there is not some, I'm not aware of any thing that would imp uh, negatively impact that. So. Okay. We, we did include the owners of the uh, Falling Hill Apartments in, in our neighbor meeting, and I believe that they were very supportive of what we were proposing, so I don't think that at least they saw some negative uh, to them. Okay, other, other questions from members of the board? Wayne? Emma? Uh, yeah, a uh, couple of questions and a comment. First, I, I get a little lost in the building height. It goes from 45 to 53 feet because of the slope. Um, and then there's a mechanical penthouse on top of that, is that correct? So what is the total vertical prominence of the building? So from the south, if you were standing on the south end of the building, uh, it would be, you'd, the building would be 45 feet tall, tall to the roof, then there would be some flat roof, and then there would be a mechanical penthouse which would be set back from all four sides of the roof, which would be 12 feet tall. So in total, uh, the building as measured from the south end would be 45 plus 12 or 57. Uh, if you were to go to the 128, the north end, where that's where the site has come across, you know, at zero, and then let's say it drops down to minus seven, uh, your building then, you know, your first floor needed to be level, right? So now you have 45 feet of lab space plus seven feet of basement showing. So your 45 plus seven is 52. 
plus your 12 feet of mechanical penthouse, 52 plus 12 is 64. The mechanical penthouse is excluded from the de definition of height in the bylaw. Okay, thank you. And thank you for doing that math. I wouldn't dare to do that in public. <laughs> and the height of the garage? Uh, the height of the garage would also live within the uh, would also live within the same, you know, 50 foot height limit. We think it probably would not exceed 35, uh, but we're still, you know, we're still playing with the capacity of the garage. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to uh, ex express my appreciation for Council Houseman's very pertinent questions uh, about the aspirational uh, aspirations of CST regarding the uh, carbon zero uh, construction. And you replied, Mr. Gordo, that uh, CST is a very progressive company. Sustainability is a central ethos. And at CST, there's a high commitment to sustainability. I appreciate all of that. And uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing about how that is fleshed out in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from members of the planning board? OK, I actually got some. Um, to some extent, I, it, it feels like that this request is being driven by the idea of CST's expansion, both in terms of building and in terms of employment. A and given that, I, I think CST entered into a TIF in 2006 that expires in 2026. And I guess one of the things I'd like to know is what were CST's obligations under that TIF and have they been met? Because it seems to me, as I said, that much of this zoning change seems to me to be premised on this idea of expansion. More jobs, uh, more jobs, we need more lab space, more building space. And um, just looking to see, we're making a significant change here. We're moving from a CG, leaving that neighborhood with, with no CG and moving it to an IR. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, again, with that TIF, what, were the, what, was, what was CST's obligations under the TIF and were they met? Because I presume they include jobs. Is that a question for me yeah. or for Darlene or? I don't think it would be Darlene, but if no, she has I it. I mean, I have that data. I'm just trying to pull it up right now. OK. We have Matt Kern is uh, Cell Signaling CFO, so my guess is he's intimately familiar. Um, yeah, I mean, I have the numbers here, but I'll let you speak on it. So um, the, the TIF agreement that we signed in, or that we negotiated in 2006, off the top of my head, we were required to uh, bring our job level at Trask Lane up to 271 full-time employees. I hope that's the right number. This is. <laughs> I know it's hard to see. So, uh, 100 and it says 90 jobs to create 171 jobs retained. Okay. So I, I, you've exceeded that. So we we've exceeded that substantially. Uh, I can't quite see. I know. The number now, but I, 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 I think we've exceeded that by, we exceeded it several years ago. I, I want to say it was six or seven years ago that we, that we hit that, that minimum, um, perhaps a little bit more than that. Um, and we've been well above that minimum uh, for many years. So I, I, I think that we're safely 50 to 60 employees above that minimum, and that's at, that's at Trask Lane. Um, yeah, I have in my chart, uh, so 90 jobs created, was the requirement 105 jobs were created at the time this was written down and 171 jobs were retained um they, you know they've continued to they them, their number of job creations might be higher yep. but that's what we have in our yeah. records and, and since then too we've we, we've expanded our uh, toza road facility at, at, uh, in beverly and we've moved a number of positions from trask lane to toza road um, and then refilled the uh, trask lane positions as thank well. you thank you Darlene, um, if I could, um, this would not, this, is, this does not create an IR overlay district. It actually changes the zoning from CG to IR. Yes, that was. Do we have any concerns that that general area will therefore have no access to CG development? 
which is a commercial retail sort of type of, of development? I think a lot of the, um, I mean, for one, there's the consistency factor with being consistent with Danvers and what can be, with a split parcel, what can be developed. Um, the other is that a lot of the kind of commercial office uses are the same or similar. Um, some of the ones I think, you know, Peter, Peter noted, um, you know, retail. I'm not sure, you know, what, that we would want a large scale retail on the size, given the size of that parcel. I'm not sure that's the use that we would want in that location. Um, so we didn't, when we looked at it, there weren't any CG uses that we thought were desirable in that location that would be precluded by making the change. Okay. And the flip side of that coin is by changing that zoning to IR, the potential uh, uses expand significantly, particularly with respect to things like marijuana. And there's no guarantees in life and there's no guarantees that CST will be there for the long haul. We certainly absolutely hope they will be, particularly with those types of jobs. But is that, is, are those types of uses acceptable in that area should that, should that arise in the future? And I know it's speculative, but so much of zoning is speculative. You have to look forward, you have to look at potentiality. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're talking specifically about a marijuana retailer or marijuana cultivation, uh, they do all require a special permit, um, and they also require a more strict state process. Um, so those specifically, I think, would have to go through, there would be a, certainly they, they could be allowed by special permit, there would be a higher burden to get them than some of the other uses that would be allowed. The uh, by right allowable uses are actually fewer than in the CG by number. But even those that are allowed by special permit are significantly different than what is allowed under CG. I think there are, I mean, in my, there are some marijuana uses allowed in the CG. Emily, my yeah, more of a retail it. basis, I think. Yes, just marijuana use, uh, retail use, of marijuana retailers. So the, the difference is that the manufacturers, I mean, that's the key difference between IR and, and CG generally. So uh, manufacturing would be allowed in the IR um, and cultivation. Um, those are so high, such, you know, they're not that in, in and of their own self. They're very comparable to a, a standard manufacturing use. Um, and again, they're highly regulated. So I'm, I'm not sure that that would be a bad outcome necessarily. I mean, they're, they would have to go through a very strict process to get approved um, and be approved by the, both the state and the city. Um, and Frank, you know, some of those building, many of those buildings are much cleaner than your standard interpretation of manufacturing and have far greater security. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily think that would be a bad thing, but yeah, I'm, just I'm not hoping sure. it's I'm, not the case. Exactly, but I'm not sure how the, how the neighbors might feel about that. Um, yeah, and I know you can't speculate to that. Um, one last question, at least from me, and that is, do we, create a, do we create a bad precedent because this feels like that we're changing our zoning to meet the specific needs of a specific taxpayer? And I, 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 that's a huge concern for me. Let me, let, me say, let me say this before. I totally understand it. I'm all for expanding our commercial and industrial tax base. Jobs are, jobs are, it's all about jobs. So I, I'm not saying that I'm opposed to this, but I have a significant concern on, that, on those grounds. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's something that we considered. Um, and as I mentioned before, that's not something that we would take lightly in terms of, you know, whether evaluating, whether we would recommend a zoning proposal. I mean, there are numerous opportunities for anyone to submit a zoning change request. Um, whether it be from the administration or from a, a citizen petition, we felt like the benefits in this situation outweighed you know, that potential cost. And as I think I tell you a lot, I don't, I don't like to say that things create precedent because every, every situation is unique. And I know that if somebody could point and say, well, you did it for this case, but um, every situation is very unique. And I don't, I don't like to imply that 
that permits that we give or uh, zoning changes that we support necessarily create a precedent. Okay, thank you. If I may add, I don't think we would have uh, asked for or suggested this zoning change were this parcel not adjacent to the IR district. Uh, and we thought that contiguity meant, uh, you know, was significant in the, in the extension. It wasn't creation of a new, you know, a new island of zoning. It was an extension. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson. Is there anybody here in the audience that uh, wants to make a comment during this public hearing on this issue? Oh. Come on, Brendan, you work for Ellen. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, there's one question that popped up that I wanted to make sure we were able to clarify. So, and Darlene, I believe this question is better directed to you. If the uh, zoning as it is stays, uh, CG and um, CST goes forward with some of the alternative development plans that they had proposed, given that there would be the absence of a site plan review requirement, what would future input from this board look like throughout that process versus where if we go through with the zoning change to IR and the site plan review requirement is implemented, what would those two if the zone, If the zoning change is not approved, um, it, will be a, it would be a building permit application. There would be no public review, no planning board review, um, no requirement for traffic impact analysis, or there would be stormwater management permits, certainly, related to the engineering department. Um, but yeah, there, the planning board would not review the project. Mm. Um, and that's based, because of the, the way our zoning is written and based on lot coverage, um, they, they would not trigger site plan review to, for this size expansion. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Um, when we're done. You what? I have a question when the planning board is done. Okay, they were done, but <laughs> Brendan jumped in quick. He's a, he's a rookie. I know he is. He's a good guy, though. I know he is. Um, I'm out to the public right now. So is there anybody else here in the uh, in council chambers? I don't think so, that would like to make a comment or ask a question. How about anybody home on Google Meet, you could type in your name and address for the record and ask a question. Oh, Stephanie Williams is what? Your hand up. Oh, she does. Okay. I'm sorry, Miss Williams. I'm fighting a war on two fronts here. <laughs> Miss Williams. Thank you. How are you on the big screen? I just, I wanted to um, respond to um, uh, a concern that sounds like the planning board chair um, may have um, concerning making a zoning change for the benefit of one property owner. And, and I can appreciate that. Um, I will just say that under case law, this, it is perfectly um, acceptable to make a zoning change, even if it benefits only one property owner, um, as long as the city can identify some rational or reasonable planning basis for making the zoning change. So I, I feel comfortable that this would um, withstand any kind of challenge that it's any kind of spot zoning. Uh, I'm not sure if that's exactly what your concern was, but I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, Thank you, Russ. Councilor Houseman, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just uh, have a request for uh, this gentleman or, or Darlene. Because we do not have uh, an as-built or, well, basically, the graphics are very difficult to follow, and we don't have any hard copies that sort of help us. So I've, I've, I have an aerial view of, of the site. And I wonder if you could just point out to me the, on this screen, conceptually, where you're talking about, just to make sure I understand the location. So is, is this picture on the screen similar to what you're looking at? Uh, yes. Okay, all right, so Darlene's got a great idea, we'll use the cursor. So the, oh no. Um, so the area of expansion, this would, where you see the cursor moving now, would be approximately the location of building A. 
And then I'm going to come down here below the, the arrow into this section of the property. This is where you would see Building G, the garage. Is that helpful? Uh, yeah, that's, that's very helpful. So the, uh, the buffer, so there's this, um, if you can move the cursor back up towards 128, there's this small freestanding building. What does that represent? That is a tent. A temporary structure. Temporary structure. <laughs> OK. Um, so that if you draw sort of a vertical line through that tent up and down, there's a line of trees uh, there that provide buffers presently between self-signaling and the neighbors. All of that is going to be removed as part of the proposed development, correct? I believe that most, if not all, of this will be removed. As we get closer to 128, they'll be preserved. OK. And then the, uh, the, the 50-foot buffer that would receive the, the new vegetation, the new trees, mm -hmm. would be added to the existing trees that are in the backyards of the closest residential uh, structures? That is, that is correct. All of the proposed trees are planted on cell signaling property naturally. We you know, didn't want to assume anything about planting elsewhere. Um, but we obviously have made it, you know, we will make trees available to neighbors because I think they'll be particularly effective on there just because of the way the grades work. Some of those houses are set above the backyard of CST, or their, their backyard is above the CST site. So if, if I may, the, the horizontal line of, of, of trees up there, uh, that represents the, um, the neighborhood of Cornell and Oberlin Street? This, so that what you see in color are all new evergreens. Uh, the property line is that straight, it's a stone wall. It's that straight line uh, just to the east of all of the trees. And then the Cornell and Oberlin neighborhood is just above that. Uh, that property line. Yeah, so I'm just trying to orient myself. So Oberlin and Cornell are uh, are at the uh, top of the screen. Yes, this, the, this, is, this is Oberlin and Cornell here. Right. And the trees that go in a sort of a slanting vertical direction down, those are a, a proposed new buffer for the buildings at Apple Village. Is that right? That's correct. No, Folly Hill. Folly Hill. Uh, Folly Hill. Uh, those Hill. buildings are those buildings are set back much further from the site uh, than the homes on Oberlin and uh, Cornell. Yeah, I guess I'm looking at a parking lot here. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, yeah, I was just trying to orient myself in, in the absence of sort of a, 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 a uh, sort of better graphics. It's a little hard to pick it up on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Gordo, in, in addition oh, to- Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I had one more question oh. about that. The trees that are shown on this graphic? Yep. Uh, 16 to 18 feet, eight to nine. Is that a height represent the uh, conceptual height of the trees that will be planted when they are mature, or the height of the trees that will be planted at the time the construction is done? Great, great, great question. That's at the time of planting. And these trees will all mature at 45 to 70 feet, okay. 75 feet tall. Right. Thank you very much. Mr. Gordo, these particular trees displayed are new trees? What you see there in green are new trees. On the previous slide, the, if you'd go back, please. <coughs> uh, that one? No, go back to the... Uh, A little further. One more. I'm lost. In the middle, uh, the one in that in that range, the with the new plot of land. Yeah. The existing trees to the neighborhood that group will they stay? The the trees along this border yep. will stay. There will be some trimming of understory, in an, in order to enhance the you know the, the the growing of the new trees. But the mature deciduous trees will remain. Uh, there are there are. I want to say two or three that have been deemed dead or dying, and those would come out. But the goal was to maintain the, the mature deciduous uh, cover. Thank you. Please, Mr. Mellon. Thank you. Um, again, about these trees. Are these trees to the east and to the south, is that meant to be kind of a mitigation for the loss of green space 
that will occur when this field is uh, destroyed? It, no, it's really intended as a visual and sound buffer to separate uh, the, new, the new development, which will be closer to the existing homes than what they have currently. Uh, so it's in an effort to you know, hide, hide what's going to be built. Thank you. Uh, okay, Councilor Houseman. Yeah. Uh, sorry to dwell on this point for a moment, but uh, we did only get the the, uh, the signed. I'm not sure exactly what it's called. Uh, development agreement here, uh, just a couple hours before the meeting. So it's sort of a quick, quick attempt to, to run through it. The restrictions that are noted here have to do with setbacks uh, in this agreement. They do not address sort of the, you know, sustainability carbon footprint of the trees, which at least is sort of a specific part of your proposal. Um, and I, I wonder, this may be a question for Darlene and maybe a question for Ms. Williams. Um, in what way is the plan enforceable vis-a-vis -vis the, the, uh, the site plan for the trees? I'm a little rusty on my planning board process. Uh, would it go through site plan and would there be an enforceable um, uh, restriction that, that those trees be planted as part of the permitting uh, process? That would be something the planning board could make as a, a condition of the site plan review. So while site plan review is um, not discretionary, the board can apply any reasonable uh, conditions on their decision. So, um, for example, it, it, if a plan was presented in this case, I would recommend that the planning board do specify the amount and location of trees as one of the conditions on the decision so that it is enforceable and understood um, a, a reasonable um, condition based on, as Mr. Miller said, the, re the development of a, a parcel and removal of other trees on the site, but hopefully planting of trees in a greater amount than removed. Okay, thank you. I know the planning board, at least some of the members are, are, are all, all over this in terms of sustainability and, you know, sort of carbon footprint. So, the, but, so the, for me at least, the trees, while they don't really speak to the economics and, 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 and so forth of, of retaining a cell signal, in, in terms of the, the values that the city's articulated around uh, climate change and so forth are, are an important part of the, of the proposal for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor. Austin. I just want just Please. one more point based on because you were referencing the development agreement. Um, I think the reason perhaps it's not included is because the buffer yard is required under both conditions. So the minimum buffer yard is still required under the CG or the IR. Um, they're talking about the enhanced trees. I think it would benefit the planning board to make that a condition. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, Council Flaherty? Uh, yes, I've been listening uh, to both sides. The, I, the thought process around this is, has been good. I think we don't do this every day, um, kind of to Darlene's point. Um, the opportunity, I think, uh, before us, not only tax dollars, uh, sustainability, um, but jobs uh, is before us to help in exactly right off 128, which I think it where it should be. Um, it's a great opportunity uh, for the city. And like I said, we don't do this every day. I, mean, I think you made a valid point, but we don't do this all the time. And I'm not putting words in their mouth, but the idea of they've been looking for a place to go. And I want to keep the jobs in Beverly. I want to grow those jobs in Beverly. So we're able to have a nice strong tax base so they can afford the schools, please fire. And this is an opportunity where this is where the process should be where we're at. Um, and to me, again, a lot of good questions, but for us not to move forward on this, I think would be a mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Anyone else? Okay, hearing no further questions or comments, I'll close the City Council portion of this public hearing and refer that back to the Planning Board. Uh, members of the Planning Board, um, I think that there is some desire on, on some members' parts to be able to have some time to review that developer's agreement. So if you all are in agreement, I would suggest that we uh, move to continue our, the, our public hearing until our next meeting so that it gives us enough time to uh, read over the developer's agreement and to be able to formulate any questions. So moved. A motion by Mr. Beckwith. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Andrea Toulouse. 
I will read the roll. Alexander Kraft? Yes. Sarah Bartley? Yes. Derek Beckwith? Yes. Ellen Flannery? Yes. Wayne Miller? Yes. Brendan Sweeney? Yes. Andrea Toulouse? Yes. Ellen Hutchinson? Yes. Thank you. And now I'd welcome uh, a motion to take a 10 minute recess so that we can reconvene in, our, um, in the conference room. I have a motion by Ms. Flannery. Is there a second, please? Second. Seconded by Mr. Beckwith. I'll call the roll. Alexander Kraft? Yes. Sarah Bartley? Yes. Derek Beckwith? Yes. Ellen Flannery? Yes. Wayne Miller? Yes. Brendan Sweeney? Yes. Andrea Toulouse? Yes. Ellen Hutchinson? Yes. Motion passes. We'll reconvene in 10 minutes. Thank you. Nice Appreciate all always good to As see you. Always good to see you, too. Do I have everything? Yeah, well, Thank you. Uh, you too. That was the first time I That was a wonderful evening. Yeah, that was great. You get back. Your I was running, sir. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's as fast as you can see me run. The king has spoken. I Confirming member oh, access. Yeah. Which I had been more on the ball. Where is everyone? Where did he go? No, we're good, right? As long as we're here. Yeah, yeah. it's almost important. Um, I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes of our uh, three previous meetings. The first was held on Monday, May 17th. It was a regular city council meeting. The second was on Thursday, May 20th. It was a meeting of the Committee on Legal Affairs. And the last uh, set of minutes I would like to approve tonight are Wednesday, May 26th. And that is the special city council meeting where Mayor Cahill uh, presented his budget. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And then opposed? Thanks, guys. That's good work. Three sets of minutes approved. Communications from His Honor the Mayor. Order number 18. Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby appoint subject to your review and recommendation Ms. Katia Fisher, 2103 Broughton Drive, Beverly, to serve on the Human Rights Committee. Her term is to be effective until April 4, 2023. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Please refer to the Committee on Public Services. Order number 119, Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby appoint subject to your review and recommendation Mr. David Gendel of 21. Ocean Street, Beverly, to serve on the Salem Beverly Water Board. His term is to be effective until January 3rd, 2024. Sincerely yours, Michael P. K. Hillmere. And please refer that to the Committee on Public Services. 
I would entertain a motion to accept the late file from Mayor Kale on order number 125. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Oh, uh, no, not a roll call. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank goodness. I promise I'll be back next time. Um, all right, so we accepted the late file. Now you read it. Yeah. Okay. Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby appoint subject to review and recommendation Mr. Blair Smith. LICSW 15 Ives Street, number 34, Beverly, to serve on the Beverly Council on Aging. His term will be effective until June 30th, 2024. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Please refer that to the Committee on Public Services. Good thing I'm not trying to ride a bike again, right? <laughs> uh, communications from other city offices and boards. Order number 120, communication from Councilor Copeland for the trash cans and trash collections around the city, primarily in city parks. We're going to refer that to the Committee of on you know, public services? Yeah, that was order, you did. Order number 21. Sorry. Do you want me to read again? No. You want to do 120 first? 120 will go. 120 one, is the marijuana. Right. 121 license. is good in public services. Okay. You want to do 120 now? I, I just did one. Yeah. Okay. No, you did 121. Okay. Order number 120 the, from communication like from home. Councilor Copeland <laughs> <laughs> for um, the marijuana dispensary license. And please refer that to the Committee on Legal Affairs. And we already took care of order number 122, the laptops. So we'll go to communications, applications, and petitions. Order number 123, communications from the city clerk, renewal of 2021 petroleum storage registration for 2021 Bass River Tennis Club at 31 Toza Road. So we'll refer that to the Committee on Legal Affairs. And now motions and orders. You don't want me to read the whole thing, right? I do. You want me to read it for you? Sure, I've had it. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Now I really feel like I'm at home. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say that. It's time for me to go, guys. Uh, in the year 2021, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Beverly as follows. Chapter 215, 215-12. Uh, Placing or depositing snow or ice into streets or sidewalks is amended as follows. One, inserting the phrase snow and ice removal into the name of the section as follows. Snow and ice removal and placing or depositing snow or ice into streets or sidewalks. Two, designating the existing provision of section 215-12 as section A and inserting the following language at the end of the section or in such a way as to obstruct the access to or the operation of any fire hydrant so that the revised section reads as follows. No person shall deposit, shall place or deposit any ice or snow on any street or sidewalk or in such a way as to obstruct the access to or the operation of any fire hydrant. Three, inserting a new section, 215-12B, as follows. Snow and ice removal. The owner of any building, structure, or lot of land abutting upon any sidewalk, including any curb, ramp, or cut, unless otherwise granted an exemption, shall, after the ceasing of snowfall, if in the daytime within six hours, and if in the nighttime before 1 p.m. the following day, cause the snow to be removed therefrom. The preceding provision shall apply to snow which falls from buildings as well as that which falls from the clouds. Two, the owner of any building, structure, or lot of land abutting any sidewalk, including any ramp, no, curb, ramp, or cut, any portion of which is encumbered by ice, within six hours after the sidewalk becomes encumbered with ice, shall, unless otherwise granted an exemption, cause such sidewalk to be made safe and convenient by removing the ice therefrom, or by keeping the same covered with sand or some other suitable substance. Three is violation of this ordinance shall be subject to a fine of $25. If the violation continues, each subsequent 24 hour period shall constitute a separate offense and be subject to a fine in the amount of $25. Four is the Department of Municipal Inspections shall be the enforcement agent in the, with the assistance of the Beverly Police Department. Five, the Commissioner of Public Works shall have the authority to extend the time frame set forth in subsections one and two in the event that severe weather conditions warrant such. 
Any such extension shall not exceed six hours without the approval of the mayor. C, exemptions. Individuals may be granted an exemption from the requirements of this section upon the submission of a form to the city attesting that one, they are unable to perform snow and ice removal as are required herein because they A, are over the age of 65, or B, physical health reasons prevent them from doing so, and two, due to the financial hardship, they are unable to hire somebody to do so. Any such exemption must be renewed annually. And this is the final passage? This is final passage. Yeah, final passage. Uh, it was, first reading was May 3rd, and today it's final passage, and it was in the newspaper as well. Council Houseman. Uh, yes, Mr. President, I, I just want to say that uh, I've had an opportunity to speak with Councillor Rotunda about this and, and not with uh, Councillor Feldman because we would be uh, open meeting law violation as she's on the same subcommittee as me. Um, I'm going to, uh, as I have in the prior two votes, um, uh, readings of this, you know, vote in favor of this. Um, and I want to compliment uh, and, and acknowledge the work of, of my colleagues on, on, on bringing this forward. Um, I'm going to vote for it because I, I don't want the uh, the uh, perfect to be the enemy of the good. As a lawyer, I have some issues with the drafting of this, um, but those can be addressed over time uh, as needed, if needed. Um, so I just want to compliment them on their on their hard work and uh, the question of, of the council having resources to help them draft, uh, you know, draft language and ordinances is, is a separate question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Houseman. Anybody else? Councilor Feldman and Councilor Rotundo, I'm sure you've uh, commented on this and thought about it enough. So I would entertain a motion to approve uh, the ordinance. So, so moved. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero. Thank you. And that is all we have for this evening, correct, Ms. Kent? Mr. President? Yes. May I just uh, make a mention of the. Uh, I know, I'm not to that part yet. I uh, you see, you were just. My apologies. I'm, I'm new to this. It's uh, the second All we have on our meeting. agenda this evening. Is there anything anybody else would like to say? <laughs> um, I'm going to go to Council Rotunda. Well, thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> I just I wanted to. We rehearsed this. <laughs> I just wanted to recognize the uh, police department's um, their, uh, Memorial Sunday yesterday. Um, they did have five officers who passed on to either natural or two who passed on earlier than expected. I just wanted to recognize them and show that I, you know, there were several councils that were able to make it. I know many of us were busy, but just that. I just want to, you know, recognize their um, dedication still to the city. Thank you. Yes, it's always a nice morning and, uh, you know, a tradition that started about 20 years ago and it, it's nice that it continues to this day. Anybody else? Okay, tomorrow night we have a budget hearing starting at 7 p.m. Uh, a couple of important people are here. It will be, I'm gonna get there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going back to the garage. I'm going back to the basement. No, um, a budget hearing led by Council Flaherty tomorrow night. And I know Michael Collins, the Commissioner of Public Services will be here. He's always excited to answer our questions. So make sure you have them all written down. And Dr. Chirotrick will be here from the school department. Uh, our next city council meeting is a special meeting which will be on Monday, June 14th, and that is our public hearing for the FY 2022 budget. If anybody has anything else they would like to put in for that meeting, uh, you know, make sure to get to Ms. Kent before uh, Thursday before noon. Is that it? Thursday before noon? I'm at a conference. Okay. I, so. so you get back to Christine. Thank no? Christine and I are both on the conference. Okay. We'll figure it, it out. <laughs> I did. Uh, Councilor Houseman? Yeah, I just have a question. Do we have any information about whether we're likely to have real air conditioning uh, tomorrow night? Do we know what's going on? Um, once the police station is finished and we start redoing this building, uh, then they're going to put it, I heard they're going to put central AC in. So what we've got here is what we'll have tomorrow? That's what we got. Can we bring okay. a box. We're bringing a box fan. I would. I'm bringing I've a got box a fan, a nice big one. Get a big up. stand one on each of us. Yeah. Don't be stealing <laughs> us. <laughs> and of course, uh, on, uh, I'll come up we'll bring our own. I'll bring a big okay. pedestal one. <laughs> yeah. And of course, uh, it's, it's too bad that Council uh, Copeland couldn't be here tonight for yeah. his first meeting in Council Chambers because uh, he had some hip surgery and of course we all wish him a speedy recovery 
and one of us will touch base with him. I will actually tomorrow about the two orders he put in tonight, how he would like us to proceed. Uh, that said, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call, no, no roll call. Um, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries eight to zero. Thank you to BevCam. A few technical difficulties. Yeah. Be better next time. If you tuned in at home, thank you. It's nice to be back.